Now, as a minimum for testing accuracy, you should always validate the first annulus. The first annulus that's laid down always looks different. Uh, I, I, I think it's got something to do with you know a young fish. It's not reached maturity. Their metabolism is different. They're feeding differently. Of course, the the core of the otolith is probably formed a little bit differently. So in general, for an otolith, the first annulus always looks different. Uh, but even if it's an otolith, a spine, whatever, it's important to validate where that first one is laid down. So you always know what your starting point is. And then it's usually easier to count the annuli outside this first annulus. Um, one way to do this is with a OTC marking. And that's one way that you can batch mark a lot of your uh, smaller fish. Um, another way is uh, through modal progression analysis. The OTC actually will lay a mark down on the otolith and then you can um, see this mark underneath the microscope and, and it'll tell you, um, you can you can compare where the OTC mark is to what you think an annuli is. We'll talk about this when we talk about OTC marking later. Um, the modal progression analysis is this neat technique that gives you a good estimate of where that first annulus should be. So we'll start off, um, we'll take a, a big sample of fish and look at this graph here. Let me pull up my pen. You see that what we're, we've got uh, is fish length on the x-axis. And here on the y-axis, we have otolith diameter. All right, so what do we do? We, we sampled a whole bunch of fish. We took their otoliths out, we measured the size of the otolith, and compared that to the length of the fish at capture. Clearly you see uh, a positive relationship, which makes sense. As the fish get bigger, their otoliths also get bigger. No surprise there. And so we have a regression for the otolith size against the fish length. Now, we're going to do this in winter because we know we you know that's when the annuli are laid down so that we know that they're the annuli are laid at the very edge of the otolith when we're sampling and if you look at what we just added to this graph you have your uh, length frequency histogram and so if you look at this frequency histogram you can sort of look and and use that length frequency technique to kind of get a feel for the younger aged fish and if you think about this, um, it, work, it works very well for picking out the younger fish. Because in the first winter of a fish's life, their year class is still very strong. You get a lot of mortality over that winter. But if you see a, a modal group like this toward the smaller sizes, that has to be the young of the year fish. Any fish that are older than younger of the year are going to be a little bit larger and you start to get a lot of overlap in the larger fish say out here and as fish get older and their growth slows you start to get overlap which we saw when we talked about the length frequency um, technique but clearly in that first winter this um, uh, large bar right here represents that year class that young of the year fish okay well then we can if we know that these are the young of the year fish then we know that this is sort of the average size of an otolith of a young of the year fish but think about what's going on so this is the young of the year fish in its first winter so it's laying down its first annulus and it's laying that annulus down at the very edge of the otolith. So whatever size that otolith is right now in the winter, that's the average size of where you're going to find the first annulus. And so if you just see what that size is on the y-axis, that should be about the size, you know, where the first annulus should be relative to the focus. Again, think about that this is in the winter. 
And so the annulus, say, say the otolith of these young of the year fish is running about um, 11 or 12 uh, micrometers. Well, in five or six years, if you recaptured that fish, that first annulus is going to be about 11 or 12 micrometers from the focus because that's where it's being laid down right now. And so if you looked at an otolith years later, you could measure the size of that uh, first annulus, the diameter of that first annulus. Again, you know where that first annulus is, that's how big the otolith was during that fish's first winter of life. And so in that way, you can validate, yes, this seems to be the first annulus, or no, it does not seem to be the first annulus. Now, theoretically, if you had good modes elsewhere on the, uh, on the chart, you know, if, if you had a stronger mode than this, where you could sort of clearly tell that these were one-year-olds and these were two-year-olds, you could kind of do the same thing to validate other annuli. But, of course, as you know, with length, frequency, histograms, and aging fish that way, um, there's a lot of assumptions involved, and... Um, the older the fish get, the much more difficult it is to pick out individual year classes. That's why this is only used for the uh, first annulus. Okay, then once you've validated the first annulus, the, the other minimum thing you need to do is validate the increment for all age classes. So what this is saying is, is you might never have known age fish where you can validate the actual age. But at least you can validate the first annulus, and then you can do mark recapture of the adults to validate that the annuli are being laid down at other older age classes in much the same way. And if you do those two things, then you can feel more confident in the accuracy of your aging technique. All right, take a drink of soda. That's better. So, um, accuracy is, much, is very important, but it's very difficult to measure. Precision is also important, and it's much easier to measure. Several different ways we can talk about precision. Remember that this is the reproducibility or the repeatability of age estimates. One reader um, on the same structure many times, do they always get the same answer? Many readers looking at the same structure, does each reader seem to get the same answer? Precision is not a proxy for accuracy. You can be precisely wrong. And so don't get lulled into a false sense of security if everyone in your lab is getting the same answer when you're aging fish. That means that your precision is good, that's a good thing, but that does not mean you're accurate. You have to keep that in the back of your mind. Maybe, you, 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 again, if you don't have known age fish, you can't always ensure accuracy, but you have to keep that in your mind, that, pre, that precision is not a proxy for accuracy. Okay, well, how are we going to measure precision? One way is percent agreement. For example, 95% uh, agreement within one year. So, uh, say, you and I each age the same 100 otoliths, and on 95 of those, we're at least within a year of each other. That's percent agreement. Um, this is not a very good measure of precision because it varies too much between different species. A better way of, of measuring and reporting precision is something called the average percent error, or the APE. Basically, it's just the error as a percentage of the mean age. So let me step you through the calculations and you can see how this works. Here are four readers, all aging the same structure. And in the first column, you see the age that each reader gave to this structure. So three out of four called it nine, one called it ten. So pretty good precision. In the second column, you see the mean age. So across all the readers, this is the average age that they've given. Now, the third column, or the fourth column, third column of numbers, is the absolute value 
of the difference between the age and the mean age. So this is, you know, the how, how far is each individual off from the average? And it's just the absolute value. So you can see how if there's a lot more variability here, then each reader is going to be farther from the average, and the absolute value of the difference is going to be higher. But in this particular example, you see that we have good precision. Each reader is very close to the average, so the difference is very small. And then finally, just to standardize things, you take that difference as a percentage of the mean age. So for example, 0.25 divided by 9.25 gives us 2.7%. And then the second reader, their percent difference is 8.1%. So you notice that we do this calculation for each reader, and so that you can see for each reader, you have their percent difference. You know, how far they were from the average age turned into a percentage. And then if you take the average of that column across all readers, that's the ape. Average percent error. And so if you look at these numbers, you can see how if you have less precision, then the absolute difference is going to be higher. And so then the percent, uh, when you convert that to a percent, that's probably going to be higher, and your ape's going to go up. So here, let's look at this fish you see that you have much less precision. They vary from 3 to 6, and, and uh, the mean age is 3.5, so the difference as an absolute value is higher, the difference as a percentage is much higher, and the ape is much higher. So that's how one way that you can report precision. Here's the uh, formula, uh, if that helps you out, but um, Basically, this is just the mathematical way to write what we just did. Now, another way to measure precision is the coefficient of variation. And this is just the standard deviation as a percent of the mean. And you should already be familiar with the coefficient of variation. This is a standard um, statistical technique. It's a way to take variability, as measured by the standard deviation, and standardize it so that you can compare variability across species, across taxa, and this is also a very good way to report precision. So here's our first example. We've got good precision. You see you've got um, four readers and they're all pretty close. The average is nine, average age is 9.25. The standard deviation of these numbers is 0 0.5. And so the coefficient of variation is the standard deviation divided by the mean and converted to a percent. So it's 5.4 percent, and compare that. The ape, um, if you uh, first off, if you calculate this for several fish, so this is for one fish. Of course, you're going to have multiple fish. So for each fish in your data set, you'll have a value of CV. Then you take the average of all those, you get a mean CV. And if you recall, for this fish, the ape was 4.1. Now these are not directly comparable, but you see that that again in a relative manner the more variability you have the less precision you have the higher the CV. And this is just another way to report precision. Um, so here's the uh, mathematical formula for that. This top part that is actually just the standard deviation. So there's essentially no difference between these two. You're going to, to kind of get similar answers and they're, they're both good ways to report precision. The CV, I think, is more familiar. Uh, more people know what the coefficient of variation is, and it's found in a lot of stat packages, so it's already built in. So I think the coefficient of variation is, is a good way to measure the precision of your estimate.